Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Wow. Hi, everybody. My name is Andy. I'm blessed to be an alcoholic, blessed to be with everybody today, and I don't know where to begin. Um, you know, I think, what do I have? Two hours, right? Mel and T. Ah, that's just April fool. No, nah, I know. I know. I don't want you to say at the end, you know, instead of thanks for sharing, thanks for stopping, you know, because I have been told that I can get enchanted with the sound of my own voice at times. But, um, wow. And that video, you know, um, if, if <laughs> Phil Collins, if, if in the air tonight was shown, I would have absolutely lost it, but you know, that was wonderful. And, Thank you to the Broken Elevator. Um, thank you, Mel and Tamara and the whole service team and and everybody that's joined us today um, that I've met over the last period of time. You know, um, this quilt of love we call Zoom, right? Um, that's where we are today. And I, I have a lot of things I want to say. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to try to get everything in that God wants me to say because, you know, um, I'm one of those that tries to think about what I'm going to say before, maybe write a few things down and then, you know, God's in charge. You know, um, I took that step three uh, decision seriously. You know, I'm not managing my own life anymore. Um, but I do want to say something about, um, uh, about a home group, you know, because this is, um, this is where the fellowship really, really took hold with me. Um, I never ever felt like I belonged anywhere. And um, they all put a warm blanket around me and said, welcome home. You know, they said, um, you'll never have to feel this way again. And I couldn't escape them. You know, I could not escape them. So, so this is the home group um, that I'm speaking of. It's the same as Carlos. It's a Westwood morning after group. Uh, You'll see bagels around there, you know, sesame bagel on the top. Um, Yeah, it it is about bagels, recovery and fellowship. And um, you know, we've been hybrid for a long time. We've been just on Zoom for a long time. And um, what I want to do is just take you into the room for a minute. You know, there's actually two rooms. So you walk down a flight of steps in this big church, this big blue church, St. Andrew's Church, and you get hit by a an overwhelming sense of just joy and happiness and camaraderie. You know, and that's what we that's what happens there. You know, we we get 80 to 100 people and you know, you'd walk in and you'd see the chairs. You'd walk in, you'd see this this beautiful, um, uh, this beautiful, uh, <laughs> you know, just table that was put together by a, by a guy by the name of Jason B. And there's the bell and there's the the basket to, to, to for a seven tradition. You got the shades over there. Um, it's a large room. We get eighty to hundred people there. But I want to take your attention to the to the picture on the right. That's um, that's known by uh, three names: the beginners room the boiler room, as you can see, and also the holy room. And there's Tony's coat, by the way. But the point is, is that what happens in this room is um, after the chairman, the chairperson actually, you know, reads some things and then says, go to your meetings, because there's two meetings going on at once. A lot of people line up, no matter how much they have in terms of sobriety time and go in the back. Around the table are people that have uh, less than a year. And around in, in the rows around the table, are folks that uh, are over a year. And um, it becomes a place where many people's lives have been saved. And what happens is people move from the inside of that, that circle to the outside. Some actually go out and come back. They go back to the inside of the circle and they come out again. Um, this is our home group. This is um, actually a pretty momentous day because tomorrow, April 2nd, is the first time that we go back in person into our original church in, in St. Andrews. So it's kind of fitting to have it, be able to speak about that. So um, thank you, Mel, for showing that today. And um, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a real alcoholic, you know, um, and I'm a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, maybe an Orthodox fundamental, mem- fundamental member of AA, which means I talk about the big book a lot. I cry a lot. And I don't apologize for any of that, you know. I was taught to, um, that my tears need to be respected, you know, and I was taught to honor my tears. Um, 
And, and that's what happens. So if, if I'm crying, I'm going to do my best to, to speak as I cry, which uh, one of my most important spiritual teachers, Scott L., taught me to do. Um, so my sobriety date, October 21st, 2005. Um, I'm sober today um, because I have a conscious contact with step one. Um, it's not that I'm living off an old memory of what happened to me, you know, the day of my last drink. You know, I, I remember that day. I remember it was two shots of warm Jägermeister um, as my wife, Susan, was walking out the door in complete disgust. Um, but I have a conscious contact with that, with that today because I know that to drink is to die. You know, I came in here defending my right to drink. Um, you know, I wasn't one of you. And now I know and, and talk about an awakening, right? There's one awakening right there that I know that the drink is to die. You know, that coupled with practicing the strict spiritual disciplines of 10, 11, and 12, you know, enlarging and, and deepening my relationship with God, you know, um, it's not just about being in his grace today, the master's grace. It's about what the relationship is, you know, what is that relationship? So that happens in 10, 11, and 12. And, you know, what happens in here is that, you know, we come, we get exposed. You know, I want to thank, thank God for, for great, you know, sponsorship that I've had over the years, for Jerry, for Ryan, um, and Rich. And, um, and, and you know, what, what I was taught was that we have, like, certain, certain spiritual laws. And one spiritual law is that if I'm disturbed, there's something wrong with me, Right. Um, and I believe there's another spiritual law in here, maybe that doesn't get, get uh, said so much, you know, that someone taught me that uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, plagiarism is wisdom, only stupidity is original, which means I, I'm saying stuff that other people have said, you know, that have taught me because I couldn't get sober on, you know, what was in my head, you know, I've learned from all of you, whether it's somebody that has 50 years, a day, an hour. I continue to learn, continue to try to be teachable, you know, and my sponsor had to tell me what it means to be teachable. It's a willingness to, to be led. And, um, and that's what I want to talk about in this, in this journey in, in fellowship that's, that's happened for me. Um, you know, it, it is truly, it is truly by God's grace, by the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, in which I was taught there are two, the spirit of the fellowship, the fellowship of the spirit. By the 12 steps which changed me, which changed us uh, by my family, my wife and, and children have been with me right from the beginning that I get to live a life today well beyond anything I ever could have imagined. Um, this journey in fellowship went from a guy who, you know, whose who's, who's melody of his life, me, was a cappella. And today it's an absolute symphony. You know, Bruce Springsteen likes to talk about, you know, I, I'm, you know, it's a sad man who lives in his own skin and can't stand the company, right? That's not true today, you know? All I ever wanted to do was to be able to spend the day being me. And you taught me that. You taught me that it's okay to be me. Because in the end, the story of me is really about my story with relationship with God. The story of my life is the story of my relationship with God. You told me that. And, you know, a few, few weeks ago, Tamron and Mel put up uh, the song Happy. Um, you know, by, Will, by uh, you know, uh, Pharrell Williams, right? And one of the great lines in there is that my life is like a room without a roof. Um, that's what it is today. Endless possibilities. Endless possibilities. So um, I want to read one thing real fast. It's where um, the fellowship, you know, we crave comes from, right? It's on page 164. And... Um, and the paragraph is, still you may say, but I will not have the benefit of contact with you who write this book. We cannot be sure. God will determine that. So you must remember that your real reliance is always upon him. He will show you how to create the fellowship you crave. Um, yeah. I, I, I got to you um, after a 30-year 30 um, 30 run, you know, ripping and running for 30 years. Um, you know, and I could, I could easily simplify my whole drunk a lot um, and say that, you know, I drank enough alcohol. Um, 
I almost destroyed myself in the process. I put a lot of harm out into the world. And, um, and I was ready to, to, for you. Um, but there's, there's some good stories there, you know, there is. And, and there were some good times, you know. I mean, I, uh, you know, I'm a retired New York City club animal, which meant that I, as a child of the 70s, went everywhere. You know, I happened to latch on to some people that were able to get into all the clubs in New York that were, uh, that were the rage, you know, from Studio 54 to the Mud Club, CBGBs, uh, Danceteria, uh, the Limelight, um, it, it, endless, endless amount of stuff. And there was some fun nights, you know, there was some fun nights. So I'm not going to tell you that there wasn't some fun, you know, but the fact of the matter was I didn't get here um, because, you know, I had a few bad weekends. I got here because of a few bad decades when I look back, you know. Um, my first drink was at age um, 15 in summer camp. Um, it was ice cold beer. And uh, I, mean, I thank God for that drink because by the time I got to age 15, you know, living, you know, completely isolated and frozen and just, you know, not fitting in everywhere. You know, I, I certainly might have blown my brains out if I hadn't had that that electrifying experience when uh, these older guys gave me some ice cold beer, you know, and suddenly, you know, I moved from the outside to the inside, you know, it was like Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah, you know, you name it, right? I moved from the outside to the inside and I could now talk to girls. I could talk to guys. Um, I was completed, you know, I was absolutely completed. And what I was to find out in here was that the depths of what alcohol gave to me in the beginning that depth was the depth of what it was going to take away from me at the end. Um, and I'll get to that. And that, that was, that was a revolutionary experience. And, you know, that was beer, got sick, you know, felt like hell the next morning. And then, you know, as, as time went on that day, I knew I was going to do that again. I had found what everybody was talking about because I, I came into this world just completely broken and not being able to relate to anybody. You know, not at all. I had no relations with anybody of any substance um, to speak of. And, and you know, that light got shown on that when I came in here, um, you know, and sobered up and went through the, with the work, you know, from four to seven with my sponsor. I saw the depths of the, you know, despair I had in my relationships. Um, but at that time, I was off and running, you know. And, uh, you know, I went from ice cold beer to uh an old substance, some of you may know, it, it's called Tango. It's a, um, well, picture like, you know, a bottle in the bottom of a shelf in a liquor store that's filled with the worst orange juice and the worst vodka, okay? And everything settles to the bottom. And there's always dust on the bottles. Even though when they replace the bottles, there's always dust on them, okay? That's what we drank, you know? It was like a $1.99 for a quart. And it took me to another place, you know? It took me to another place. So, um, to fast forward, I, um, I did well in school, you know. Um, other substances are a part of my story. I'd be called a, a garbage head <laughs> um, in, the, in New York City, you know. This is what we did, you know. Um, and I, I just kept going, um, you know, progressing to not just the weekends, to a little bit during the week drinking. And... You know, I'm a child of the 70s, child of the 80s. So, you know, there's, there's other things in there that we don't need to talk about that happen. Um, but I realized today that every, every other substance I did just allowed me to drink more. It was always about going out drinking, you know. Um, went to college, got a number of degrees. You know, my sponsor, when I came in, you know, I was trying to figure everything out. I kept looking at him with that, you know, like that, that look, you know that sponsors know and they go, you're still trying to figure this out now, you know? And I came in, you know, with a lot of degrees and, you know, Jerry said to me that thermometers have degrees, you know, where they put thermometers, right? I mean, all that knowledge meant nothing, you know, all that knowledge meant nothing. Um, and I went through, I went through college, graduate school along the way, met my wife, Susan. Um, she was like me. She was right next to me you know, running and running, you know, like me. And then eventually she just slowed down and I just continued. And um, what ended up happening was by fast forward, you know, um, uh, through, through those years um, with, 
you know, we have two children, um, got a, had, you know, had a good job for a lot of years. Um, I was now off on my own beginning to really isolate, you know, even though if you looked at me from the outside, you'd think that everything was okay. You know, the job, marriage, two cars, all of that. Um, but what was going on inside of me was, well, we talk about it in, in, a, in the 12 and 12, the pangs of anxious apartness, you know, a hole in my belly with the wind blowing through it. That was, that was growing. You know, see, alcohol was a, was a, um, you know, was kind of an interim fix for me, you know. Um, it was an artificial way to a spiritual experience. A little did I know that when I got here that you would show me the bona fide real way for a spiritual experience. And that's the 12 steps, right? The formula for sobriety, the formula for God, and the formula for a good life, all contained in 12 steps in an order for a reason. But I didn't know that at the time. And what was happening for me was that I wasn't able to um, to really, you know, fill that hole anymore, you know, um, as alcohol did for me for a long time. I could get drunk once in a while, but not really fill that hole. But I, I was, you know, basically a, um, a robot at that point, you know. And here's every day, you know, every day was like this. I would, I would get in the car. Um, Take my daughter, uh, take my daughter to to school, and I would show up. I worked about forty miles from where I lived in northern New Jersey, you know. And I would get down to um, uh, this town of Rahway, New Jersey, which we'll get to in a minute. And um, and I would go to my office, and I would start drinking, you know. And then I would leave, and then go into Manhattan, and go from, you know, hotel bar to hotel bar. You know, I fashioned myself a big drinker with martinis and everything. And then I would go over this uh, bridge near my home. You may know the George Washington Bridge. Beautiful bridge goes between New York and New Jersey. And there's this wonderful um, road called the Palisades Interstate Parkway, which overlooks um, overlooks Manhattan and New Jersey. And I would go from rest stop to rest stop, and I would be having two conversations. It was like two trains going back and forth. One conversation was, everything is great. Look at where you are in your life, you know, have another drink. The other conversation was, this has got to stop. This has got to stop. And I got to the point where it just seemed easier to just take my car and go over the embankment, you know, into the river. Or I probably wouldn't have been into the river. It would have been a mess going down, you know. It, oh, God knows, you know, it would have been horrible. Maybe I would have even survived it, you know, and been paralyzed. Who knows? I mean, in any event, that was going through my head. So what had happened for me was that um, I could not live anymore with the way I was living, but I had no options. You know, we talk about the jumping off place, right, in our literature. I can't live with alcohol. I can't live without alcohol. And I was to know a loneliness that few would know. And I felt that loneliness, you know. Um, I was in the abyss of my own wretchedness dying the alcoholic death, but still living. See, I had a problem living now. I also had a problem dying, uh, but I had no solution. And I would get home at night and I would just uh, pass out, mumble some things at home and pass out and that would be it. And the way I got here, the way I got here was um, I was in my office and a um, phone call came from Susan and she said, some money's missing. This is a lot of money, actually, just for my daughter's bat mitzvah. Um, oh, I didn't happen to mention, you know, I am Jewish, and I did think that there were no Jewish alcoholics. Um, I was to find out quite different, you know, because just for a second, when I came in, everybody was Irish Catholic from the Bronx, you know, with six or seven brothers and sisters. And I'm this, this Jewish kid from Brooklyn and um, whose mothers had four husbands, you know, so I don't, I, I can't be one of you, right? I can't be one. Um, so Susan says the money's missing. And there's a gap. You know, and I I was a cha champion liar, you know. I mean, how would I live this other life if I wasn't a good liar, right? I mean, I, you know, I learned that growing up. You know, it's kind of like a James Bond situation where you want to keep that life on the down low. And for me, lying was a skill, you know. It was a way to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. 
And that's what happened. You know, I was doing that. I didn't lie when she said, you know, money's missing. And this is where I know, you know, that God came between me and my mouth for a second. And Susan caught that pause and she said, what's the matter? She was real worried. She said, do you have cancer? And I said, no, I could have lied about that. Maybe bought a little time. No. I said, I think I'm an alcoholic. Oh, <laughs> well, that's where, you know, that's where the, the crap really hit the fan at that point. And uh, little did I know I was in the throes. And, they, and she didn't know either. Throes of an absolutely fatal illness that was progressing to the point where it was going to kill me. And from that moment on, after dialing an 800 number um, that, you know, thank God for the job I had, you know, I was able to do that. Um, I came to you. And the way I came to you was through the fellowship. Um, I, um, I was completely frozen and lost. I couldn't speak. If I cried, it was cold tears. Um, I had nothing to say. You know, because I, I got to you because I was caught. <laughs> I was caught. And uh, we have a guy in our home group, Harry B. Um, everybody knows his um, sobriety date. It's February 1st, 1984. You know it because he says it every time. And uh, I know it better than my kids' birthdays, actually. February 4th, 1984. In any event, Harry said, you ran out of lies. Yeah, I ran out of lies. You know, the jig was up. I got caught. And um, I ended up going to a local rehab. Uh, you know, and this is where the fellowship really began. So there's a, there's a rehab in New Jersey known as High Focus. It's in Paramus. We get to do meetings there virtually now for the past number of years. It's been awesome. Carlos has been there. We get to go back, you know, full circle. And I get to this high focus and it ends up that, um, you know, I don't graduate. You know, I get thrown out of there because I can't give a clean urine. You know, they would let us go out at halftime. You know, some guys would go smoke. I would go to my car, warm bottles of vodka, airplane bottles, maybe do another substance and go back in there and said, yeah, I'm OK. Um, yeah. So eventually they just said, you know what, you're just taking up space. It's time to leave. But I know today that my recovery didn't start with the first step. It didn't start with step zero. It started with the 12th step in someone else's heart. Who um, I don't remember who they were. I don't remember what they said. But they came and brought AA meetings into that facility. And um, they carried this message. Not the message, this message. You know, They were out there on a Thursday. Um, when it wasn't their home group in lousy weather to carry the message, you know, because they they knew that their thoughts, you know, their thoughts, their constant thought of others would save them from dying an alcoholic death. They knew they had to give back. And um, that begins, you know, that begins the hardest step for me, which was the doorstep, right? The doorstep, the doorstep going into that home group in Westwood, New Jersey. And, um, and that's where I was engulfed, you know, by the fellowship. You know, I'd always been in this island of misfit toys, kind of getting, ripping and running through my life. And then suddenly I get thrust into this, this unbelievable, unbelievable sea of love that, um, that I had missed. You know, and they, they said to me, you know, we're going to love you until you love yourself. And um, I said, okay, all right. Um, I didn't hear much, you know, of what that really meant. Um, but when I, um, when I hung around for a while and I started to marinate in those rooms and I started to thaw out, that's when the pain began, you know. I could not go back to alcohol, didn't want any of the other substances. You know, I was what you call stark raving sober for a while, for about six months. And uh, the fellowship really kept me alive during that period. They let me chair meetings. You know, I wasn't drinking. They let me um, go on outspeaks. Um, because what had happened for me is while the 12th step in someone else's heart had hit, you know, me without me knowing it, the first step hadn't hit yet. And uh, I needed to go through um, what some of you on this call may be going through now, and that's step zero. Um, now, I couldn't talk about what step zero was until 
till I went out to Los Angeles meetings and guys like, you know, Joe H would talk about it. Um, and I heard about it. And uh, Step Zero is this wonderful, uncomfortable place where you go uh, from your last drink to when you're ready to accept spiritual help. And they call it zero because you go round and round and round thinking that you have more options. And what are the only options? Eventually, die an alcoholic death or live on a spiritual basis. I didn't see that. Again, Jewish alcoholics, no. What if I cut out the other substances? Maybe I'll be able to drink safely. What if I just take a break? What if, you know, I leave my wife again? I didn't mention that, but I'd left Susan um, for a few months prior to uh, you know, 2005. And it, it turned out that um, I needed to go through that fuse um, really slowly, right? Really slowly. And what worked for me was sitting with a sponsor and more about alcoholism, chapter three, reading that line by line, word by word, you know, because that chapter for me does an unbelievable job of setting aside everything my disease wants me to use to separate me from you and ask me two questions. When, I'm alcohol, when, I, when I drink alcohol, does the drink take me? All right. Do I ignite this allergy? this phenomenon called craving that I can't stop. But then we go back to the second part. The second part is of powerlessness is when I'm not drinking, does my mind take me back to a drink no matter what misery, what heartache has happened before? And I got to that point. I got to that point where I saw that I was one of you, you know? Um, I stopped defending my right to drink at that point. You know, I was done, it was over. But now we get to the dash, right? right? The spiritual malady. And this is where, this is where the fellowship, um, the fellowship of the spirit comes into play for me. Um, I, I have many stories of connecting with people now. Um, to fast forward, you know, with terrific sponsorship and, and wonderful sponsees that have taught me unbelievable things and wonderful spiritual teachers that I, I could name, you know, from Eckhart Tolle to Emmett Fox to Joe H to, <laughs> to Adam T to Scott L and many others. And, and also to Mel and, and Tamara on the call today and some of, and some of you. Um, I was so con disconnected for so long because I could not um, have a relationship of any meaning and substance with anybody. It didn't m matter that I had two children. I had a wife and was still married 37 years. There was no honesty and depth and gentleness in any of these relationships. And really what would happen was by going through the steps, by going through four and five multiple times, um, you know, I go from resentment to forgiveness, Right along that dash. That's, that's what happens. Um, but first, got to go back to the hole, you know, the hole that's always been there. Um, you know, there's that great letter that uh, Bill Wilson got uh, from Carl Jung that talks about a spiritual thirst, you know, for wholeness that, that we have, that I have, that I have. And um, I, I, just, I just couldn't describe it till I got here, you know? I couldn't describe how I felt. So the big book talks about, the 12 and 12 talks about the pangs of anxious apartness, you know? A hole in my belly with the wind blowing through it. Um, you know, most people live lives of quiet desperation. I had all that all along. And it didn't matter what the outside looked like, right? Um, you know, Adam T likes to say that, you know, I was like a swan. You know, and the swan looks so, so graceful when the swan goes onto the, onto the, you know, the, the pond or whatever. But underneath, paddling like hell, you know, that, that was me forever. Um, so it was all about relationships, right? And I was scared about this because when I started to look at the literature, literature, my sponsor pointed out to me, you know, in the 12 by 12, literature says that, you know what, I'm, I'm probably incapable of forming a true partnership with another human being. That's heavy, you know, maybe with God too, you know. And of course, when we read in How It Works, we talk about honesty, you know. 
constitutionally incapable of being honest with oneself. I hadn't told the truth, the whole truth of anything for years, <laughs> for years, you know? And now, you know, you talk about the truth, right? It can be a little inconvenient to some people to listen, right? So in New Jersey, they have um, uh, a reduced fare if you reach a certain age, right? If you reach 63, right? You get half fare. And um, I, I was like 62 and a half. And um, I, I was going to buy a ticket for full fare. And my wife says to me, why don't you buy the senior fare? And I said, I'm not 63. Why should I do that? And she looked at me like I was crazy, you know? And yeah, it, it, it's easy to tell the truth today, you know? <laughs> It's, you know, I have to watch it, but it is easy to tell the truth. So this is what you all taught. Uh, so the constitutionally being incapable of being honest with oneself, right? All of that. The ability now to look, look really at things in an honest way. You, you people taught me. I was worried that I was constitutionally incapable of being honest with myself. I was absolutely thought I was one of you and I would be absolutely doomed if I couldn't tell the truth. And, you know, um, I had this nickname in college, you know, I mean, and I'll get to that in a second, but if you'd met me, you would have thought I was a nice guy, right? Nice guy, friendly and everything. But I, all I cared about was taking from you. You know, I was a taker, buy me, bring me, give me, or I'd steal it. You know, that was me. Um, yeah, that was me, and, and I, I was proud of that. That was the way I lived. That was the way I survived. Um, and I, and I, you know, come in here, and in order for me to learn how to be a giver, you know, I first have to be a receiver of your love. You taught me how to give. I had no idea how to give. Um, you know, I can't even really say this in my home group. Um, because supposedly I'm not this way, but I'm still a little suspicious sometimes, you know, when, when, when I listen to the first thought in my head. But so that my nickname in college was, was ADB. And I'm told I'm okay to say this. ADB stood for Andy Douchebag. And I lived that with, with pride and honor, you know. Um, I had some, there were some other names for me too, but that's the only way I can stay right now. Uh, so it is all about the relationships. Um, and the fellowship that we crave. And I want to talk about a few stories, um, you know, because, you know, we're supposed to tell our stories in a general way, right? What we used to be like, what happened and what we're like now. Um, one of the things, before I get to the stories, that, that, that actually was revealed in multiple thoughts there was, you know how we say what we used to be like, what, what happened, what we're like now, what we used to be like, you know, somebody opened that up for me in a, in a different way. What did I used to be like? What did I use to be liked? I used everything to be liked, you know, and it was all fear based, right? Because fear is the chief activator of all our character defects. So fear was always at the base of it. I was so so overwhelmed by what you thought of me. I got my sense of who I was by what you thought of me, you know? And um, that's what I used to be liked, along with other substances and things like that. And it's much better now. It's much better now, you know? Um, and, and that was another like, revelation that I never thought could ever, I could ever be freed of, you know, when it became so clear, you know? We say in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, don't live, don't leave until a miracle happens. Well, don't leave when a miracle happens, you know? And I, if I had written down what I expected in this program and this fellowship when I got here and said, that's all I wanted, you know, I would have sold myself really short. And to be able to face that fear of what you think of me and not be driven by it all the time. I mean, I do care what you think of me, but, you know, I care, but I'm not, un I'm not, I'm unaffected by it. You know, it's a totally different thing. So. The fellowship. Um, three stories. I could really go on forever. I, the, the, first, the first one is about my journey following spiritual teachers. Um, once, once I saw that 
I was completely home with you wherever I was and at home with myself. Um, I got to go to meetings all over, all over the world, right? In person, you know, and it's been amplified in the last couple of years with Zoom. And um, along the way, um, I, uh, I went back locally to, um, to the town that, uh, that I worked in for many years, Rollway, New Jersey. Now, Rollway is also known, besides from my company, it's known for a maximum security prison. Um, known as Railway State Prison, also known as East Jersey State Prison. So I'm going to day meetings around uh, around the area. You know, by the way, I was a guy that did a lot of night meetings. And then one day Susan says, you know, why don't you stay home? I'd like you to be home at night. Imagine that. She wants me to be home, right? So I started to go to day meetings, you know, around, uh, around the area down in uh, northern New Jersey, down in Railway, Woodbridge, places like that. And uh, somebody mentions, I even remember this woman, Gail mentions, hey, we need volunteers to go into the, the state prison here. And first thought was, <laughs> no way. Um, there's no way I'm going to do that. And um, I, absolutely not. And she said it like a few times at the meetings. And eventually, I asked about it. I went from one guy named Billy D to another guy, Billy D. And then six months later, I get an ID to go into this prison and I walk in there and um, I mean, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's quite an experience, you know, and, and I felt safe and protected, you know, safe and protected. You know, we talk about the steps as being, you know, protected by God at home with self and connected to a community, protected by God at home with self and connected to a community. And that's, that's how I felt going in there. Uh, my wife was not so happy about it, um, but eventually um, we came around with that. And what happened was I went in there and brought brought with other sober men, a typical AMA, AA meeting, into this huge chapel with many of the residents' inmates around. And I was to meet a lot of men there over, over the years. We've been going into that prison for about nine years um, before before the pandemic hit. And we still can't get back in there. Um, that's just the way it is for now. In any event, um, we sat and we did the big book. There were guys sober for 20 years in there that had long, you know, long sentences. And I felt at home in there with these, with these men that were trying to stay sober or, or were sober a while. Um, and how did I get to know about that? Well, that woman, Elaine, said something to me about it, but also... You know, some of the spiritual teachers along the way, like Adam T. and, and Scott L. had told me about it also. And um, I followed through on that. Now, every time we leave the prison and the four doors get closed, you know, we thank God, you know, that we're out of there. We just go as guests, right? Um, you know, but we always have a slice of pizza before we go in. There's a pizza place near there. So we always have a slice of pizza because, hey, you never know, right? You know, anything could happen in a prison, right? The beauty of it all is I've seen several of these guys come out, they finish their sentences, they're living crime-free lives, and they're sober. And we, I've seen them in meetings. We speak, you know, we hang out, we go to the diner together, um, talk about the fellowship, right? I mean, did I crave that? I never would have been able to state it, but I mean, the bonds, you know, we were just sitting there laughing, like <laughs> laughing in the prison, laughing when we get out of the prison during the meeting. You know, it's an unbelievable moment, you know, not to be missed. Um, one story, though, that really is, it's got to be God. Second time I went to the prison, um, met a guy who um, we started talking, and it turned out that. He had been incarcerated for a long time, did some crimes out of state, came to New Jersey, and it turned out that he was a part of the Westwood Home Group many years ago as a kid. When he was 16, he went to that church. Our, our home group's been around over 40 years. He went to that church, and he, um, and, and you know, he he was hanging out there. But you know, his his life took a different turn. Um, I met him in there. 
He started to explain himself. And then when I go back to my home group in New Jersey and tell people about this guy, they say, oh, no way. We remember him. He's still alive? I go, yeah, he's down the road. He's still got five more years on his sentence if he behaves. Then he'll be out. Um, well, he did behave. I sponsored him for a while. And he comes out. And um, I, <laughs> well, no words. He comes out. And, and he's sober, crime-free. He got married. He's got kids. I mean, what's the story there, right? So why was I still down in Rawway all those years? Now, I had this job. Um, I retired in 2016. This job, um, I started there in 1988. So they had me, you know, drunk and high for a lot of years. They had me sober for a bunch of years. It was as if. You know, when Alcoholics Anonymous took hold of me and I was able to to stay sober, work this program and help others, because that's what it's all about, right? I was able to keep my job. There were a lot of layoffs going on. There were a lot of reorganizations, right, and all this. The only reason that I could come up with that um, I was able to stay around was because, um, you know, God had a plan for me. God had a job for me to do. My job was to engage another alcoholic in spiritual activity so I could live a useful life. And, you know, in God's economy, nothing is wasted. So maybe God wanted me to hang around, go into this prison, meet this guy, and help him through the things he was going through. Um, and then he would come out, this guy, and go help others. What other reason is there, you know? I mean, I, um, why was I kept around that long? You know, I can't explain it. Maybe, maybe I'm not supposed to explain it, you know? Um, so, the, so the dash. I only have 49 seconds yet. The dash. Um, the, the dash for me is the bridge between understanding and the first step my powerlessness and the unmanageability that's within inside me. Um, that journey, you know, to, to move from um, understanding that uh, that I've just had this this hole in my soul with the wind blowing through it for the longest time was able to be filled, and the way it was filled was through through you folks and for God who showed showed me the way. Um, there's um there's there's a, a you know a great poem and I'll end with this that talks about the dash and it's by Linda Ellis. Linda Ellis wrote a poem about the dash and what she's speaking of is the dash on a tombstone and um that's the difference between birth and death and one one part of that poem is for it matters not how much we own the cars the house the cash what matters is how we live and how we love and how we spend our dash. Uh, because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of all of you, because of God, I get to live, you know, the way I was always supposed to live but never knew it. Um, and little did I know, like in The Wizard of Oz, um, the great reality was deep within me. You remember, you all remember that movie when uh, Dorothy's ready to get home and uh, she um, was told by, Glenda, the witch of the North, the good witch, not the bad witches. And they said, well, you always had the power within you. You just needed to click your heels. Well, you showed me where the great reality is. The great reality is within me and uh, within all of you. And I am out of time, so I'm going to stop here. Thanks to the Broken Elevator, Tamara, Nell, love you so much, and everybody that's joined. And uh, that's enough out of me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.